This is the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. Real, raw, and pulling no punches on long-term stock investing. He's ready to rock your investment portfolios. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Chillingworth. Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast, episode number 108, coming up on this week's show. We'll be taking a look at the UK markets and seeing how they performed so far this month. We'll then take a look at my list of hand-selected stocks and see how that's fared up against that over the same time frame. We'll then be taking a look at some of the news out of the UK markets, drilling down into each company's financials to get an improved perspective on how these businesses are performing. This week we're looking at GlaxoSmithKline after the news that they agreed to settle without liability on 80,000 claims that their heartburn drug is causing cancer in people. Pretty serious stuff. Uh, we'll also be taking a look at the Rio Tinto deal as they buy up a big US lithium miner Arcadium. We'll then discuss some of the information coming out about the new Applied Nutrition IPO that's supposedly happening later this month. We'll look at the financials of bike technology after they posted a profit increase. We'll also be discussing the recent shareholder vote regarding Hargreaves Lansdowne being bought by a private equity firm and discussing what that means not only for investors but for those using their services. Then a bit later in the show, will discuss one of my top 10 favorite books of all time that literally helped transform my finances and I attempt to pass some of those lessons down to other people. We've got a lot of content to get through over the next 45 minutes, so let's get started. Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. My name is Chris Chillingworth, episode number 108. Hope you're doing well. So the FTSE All Share Index started October at 4511. And after a positive day yesterday, and so far today as well, as of this morning, the index is now at 4535. So it's up now about 0.5% for the month so far. Uh, in August couple of months ago we saw it fall 0.3% and last month in September it fell again 1.4% so it, it hasn't recovered those losses yet overall for the full year to date the FTSE All Share Index is up about 7% so that's our kind of year to date benchmark over the last 10 years it's achieved 25.7% return which works out on average about 2.6% a year so the FTSE All Share Index is pretty easy to beat and really isn't a particularly strong index but it is probably our fairest reflection of the UK market's performance we're still seeing a significant amount of bargains in the UK. Bear in mind, I go through these stocks every single week. I am constantly looking at different companies from the UK, and I always do my price and analysis on every single one I look at. And we're still seeing some really good deals out there. This is outside as well of my, my hand-picked watch list. Uh, there are many UK stocks that are priced at a level that makes sense, unlike over in the US where the markets have soared in 2024. But all of the stocks over there now seem are, are seemingly significantly overpriced. And there's a lot of speculation of a US market crash. Warren Buffett's been selling a lot of his positions at Berkshire recently. It's making people a bit jumpy. Uh, usually this is a guy that doesn't sell anything. So... A lot of people thinking that this suggests maybe he's expecting an opportunity coming along to buy cheaper. Now, that's entirely speculation. And Warren would tell you himself that he has no idea what the market is going to do. He doesn't tend to ever try and predict the market. He's always championed the approach of it's impossible to do so. He doesn't have the skill to do so. So that's not what he tends to do. Having studied Warren for many years, I suspect it's less of, of a prediction of a crash and more that he just doesn't see any good bargains out there anymore. And I've talked about this on the podcast before, the Buffett Indicator. This is a chart that uh, measures the US market value combined in all the prices on the stock market and plots that against the, the US GDP. What is the gross domestic product that the US is US business is producing 
and it gives you an idea of whether there is a, a massive difference between what companies are actually producing in terms of value and what the markets are valuing those companies at. And there's a, a massive leap in terms of the stock market value against the underlying true value of the businesses that those stocks are supposed to be representing. And that suggests that the US stock market is significantly overvalued, which is obviously what we're seeing on an individual share basis as well. So I suspect that rather than a prediction of a crash, which doesn't sound like a Warren move, and I don't pretend to know Warren, obviously, uh, but I have read a lot of his stuff. I've watched a lot of his interviews and I've committed a big chunk of my life studying this guy. To me, it's less of a, 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 a prediction of a crash and more of a concern that he's just not getting good value for money anywhere anymore. But the selling should definitely be a concern for those in US stocks. And if there is a crash, I'm quite pleased. I would be quite pleased because I'm now doing work on US stocks, which I wasn't previously doing in previous years. That's going to allow me to be able to make sure that me and my members are ready to know what to buy and for what price we should be buying them at should that event actually come. Looking at my watch list of handpicked stocks, the list is down about 1.8% so far for October and up just over 4% for the whole year to date, January to October. So the list, the handpicked stocks list is not performing as well as the all share index so far in 2024, but it is leaps and bounds ahead for the last 10 years. It's up 184%, which is about 18.4% annual average return for the, the, the list of handpicked stocks that I've identified. And this is really just a guide. My personal portfolio has been built from this list. But of course, not everything on the list of handpicked stocks is priced at a level that makes sense to buy at at all times. And because price plays a very strong part in what I choose to buy from the list each month, my portfolio makeup is entirely different. In fact, 50% of my portfolio is made up of just four to five stocks right now, which isn't necessarily an intentional thing. It's just grown that way. Some of my uh, favorite stocks from the list were, were cheap for a sustained period of time. And so there were many months back there where I was continuously loading up on the same four or five stocks. And my personal portfolio is sitting at about £43,500 right now. I say about £43,500 because it's live right now. It's constantly in flux. Uh, but we started the month on 42000 and I have input an additional £1,500 so far this month. So we should be sitting at 43500 and that's precisely where we're at. So that means that I'm pretty much break even for the month to date so far. Uh, year to date, so from the January the 1st or the first day of trading in January uh, to now, we're up or I'm up about 10.1% for 2024 so far. So doing a lot better than that 4% that the hand-picked list has achieved. Now, 10% would be a little lower than the average that I would like to be achieving. But when you've had 33% years in the past, it kind of takes some of that pressure off. And as it stands, I'm well ahead of schedule to reach my £1 million goal. I have a, a chart that I use that I have I used a compound uh, calculator that worked out, OK, if I was to start on this and I was to achieve this annual average return and achieve this kind of dividend yield every year and pump this kind of money in every year, what would that look like? How long would it take me to get to a million? I've then taken where I would need to be at the end of each year to reach million within to reach that million within the time frame and I've plotted that on a chart and it just looks like a nice compound curve you know a curve that goes up and the longer it goes on the, the steeper it rises and I've taken that and I've plotted my actual results against that so this way I can tell whether I'm ahead of the curve or not whether I am ahead of schedule in terms of reaching that million and uh, I plot that chart I put it on my blog I share it with my members as well uh, and I update that every month as I do my updates. And we're well ahead of that that curve. We're well ahead of where we need to be. So this is good. This means that, and it might not always be that way, uh, but it helps me identify, it gives me a visual representation of where I am relative to, am I going to reach my million pound target in the time frame that I originally set myself? At the moment, we're, we're looking like we're probably going to get to that million 
if things continue at the rate that it's currently going in about 12 years time, which would put me at hitting a million somewhere in my mid 50s. And of course, I'm not going to be stopping there. Why would you sell, you know, your income producing assets that are rising in value and require very little work to no work? Uh, some people have said to me, you know, why, why stocks? Why don't you invest in property? Uh, I, I get people on Instagram sending me messages saying, don't you regret not investing in Bitcoin and stuff like that? You know, and it's, I don't think that way. I just don't honestly don't. And I try and explain to these people, that's not how I operate. It's not how my brain works. You know, you could say that about any of the, any other investment, you know, you're not regretting not investing in Microsoft 50 years ago. You know, it's like, of course, of course it would have been nice, but you didn't know that information at the time. So what stupid point, what would be the point? It's entirely, you're wasting your own time thinking about stuff like that, you know, and, and looking at the world like, oh, we should have done this. Well, you didn't. So let's move on and crack on, you know. But when people say to me, you know, why didn't you invest in property or why haven't you invested in Bitcoin? Listen, I tried property investment about 14 years ago. I found it very stressful. I found it quite hard work and I just didn't enjoy it. There were so many problems, you know, that and there are ways to reduce those problems. Once you're a bit more established, you can employ management teams to do a lot of stuff for you and stuff like that. But I just didn't enjoy it. And stocks are so much easier, in my opinion. I'm investing in other people's businesses that add value to the world in whatever way they do. And I'm riding on their success. And that allows me to get on and do the other things in life that I love doing. And if I can make 12% per year return on average doing that plus dividends, that's all I need. In a lot of wealth building books that I've read written by those who actually built immense wealth, not just theorized and talked about it. One of the repeated lessons is to stick to what you know. The moment you start chasing the, the shiny new thing, often out of, of, of greed of not being content with what you're getting and wanting more and more, that's when you end up losing money. Look at all the people who start restaurants and coffee shops who, who last a year or two before they're gone. These people invest their life savings into things they don't truly understand and they lose everything. And I'm not an expert in property, but I do understand businesses. In fact, I find them quite easy to understand. Most of them, not all. Um, there are some business uh, sectors that I just don't really go near because I don't fully understand it. And it's all a bit gobbled goopy to me. And if I don't understand the business, then I'm not going to invest in it. But I leave that kind of stuff to other people to get rich via their own means. You know, Bitcoin, property, fine art, collectibles, jewellery, whatever's right for them. If I get to my financial targets and the time frame I'm aiming for, what does it matter which vehicle I use? Yes, I could have made more money on Bitcoin, but I don't understand Bitcoin. So I probably would have lost more money <laughs> in some way, you know, and I just I don't see the point in spending time sitting there thinking, oh, I could have made all that money if I'd invested in Bitcoin. Yeah, I could have done, but I don't understand Bitcoin. The right decision was made for me to go down this road rather than go down the Bitcoin road. You can make the wrong decision and get a good outcome. The problem is that when you keep making bad decisions, you're going to get bit. Whereas you can make the right decisions and not get a favorable outcome every single time. But I would prefer to make the right decisions for me over time again and again and again, because that will probably see me good. Even though sometimes the outcome might not be perfect, then make bad decisions and sometimes get rewarded. Do you know what I mean? So that's the the way my my brain works, and hopefully I've under, I've, I've explained that in in as best way I can, I suppose. Um, looking at stocks, UK stocks. So this week we've heard that GlaxoSmithKline have re reached agreements to settle on eighty thousand cases. U.S. court cases related to claims that their heartburn drug Zantac has direct links to cancer. Uh, and I don't know the full details of these 80,000 cases, whether these people actually ended up having cancer and have proven that the drug caused it. Whatever the story is here, GlaxoSmithKline have agreed to settle without liability on those 80,000 cases. And they've agreed to pay approximately 1.8 billion in Great British Pounds, saying saying that they do not admit any liability, but they're willing to settle this case. 
So read out of that what you will. Uh, essentially, the market took this news very well. And the share price rose 6% on the day, which is astonishing in a way. Uh, it's like, you know, okay, we don't admit our drug causes cancer, but we're going to pay to make this go away. And, oh, the share price rises 6%. <laughs> and, you know, of course, this is going to be investors coming back into the stock now, now that the matter has finally got this line drawn underneath it. And... Investors, investors are now able to focus forwards on the business again. But yeah, it's kind of an ugly situation. Uh, what does a, a payout of $1.8 billion do to a company like GSK? Well, it's hardly a dent in the business. It's a company that typically makes $4.7 billion a year in profit alone. It means probably that profits are going to be down a smidge in 2024. By next year, that will probably all be forgotten. So GSK are highly profitable, banking 16% net profit per year. Last year, they managed to get their debt levels down to a reasonable level. And this 1.8 billion settlement could just be paid in cash. There's 3 billion sitting in the bank account. Moral issues aside, if we just look at the financials, this is a good stock. Not really growing anymore. Their revenue in 2017, seven years ago now, was at 30 billion. And that's what they made in 2023. So it's been stuck there or thereabouts for many years now uh, but they are a reliable profit maker they make about 12 to 15 percent a year net profit uh, for me this is more of a dividend stock so for the last decade it's been trading in a range between 13 pounds and 17 pound 50 right now you can get it at 15 so it's slap bang in the middle of that 10 year range but as the sales aren't growing, what you see now is really what you get, a 3.9% dividend payer that is good value to buy at anything under £15, but probably won't surpass £17.50 unless something radical in the business happens, like a cure for cancer. Unfortunately, it looks like recent events have sent them the other way on that one. Um, mining giants Rio Tinto this week announced news that they are acquiring US mining stock Arcadium Lithium who are trading on the New York Stock Exchange, and Rio are paying a 90% premium on Arcadium's share price of $3.08. They're paying $5.85 for the company per share. So that's a deal that's going to cost them $6.7 billion. Arcadium extracts 75,000 tonnes of lithium with plans to double their capacity by 2028. Rio say that the deal means they're now going to be considered a world-class leading supplier in aluminium, copper and lithium that are all minerals and, and resources needed to support the world's energy transition, is their phrase. Uh, the combination of both businesses will make Rio Tinto one of the largest leading lithium producers globally. And Rio are an interesting stock right now. Revenue over the last 10 years has actually climbed very well. But over the last three years, it's fallen. And it's fallen you know, consecutively over those three years from 64 billion to 54 billion. Uh, so that's something to be mindful of. Revenue is slowly ticking downwards, not upwards over those last three years. We all know what the last three years have been like. So, you know, there may be excuses for that. Uh, expenses in the business, however, have also been rising from 53% of the gross profit now to 69% of gross profit. Interest on debt is rising and profitability has been falling. So three years ago, this was a business making 34% net profit. Now that's down to 22% net profit, but it's still 22%. And whilst there is a clear decline going on over those last three years, this is a company falling from a pretty tall height. So they've got a lot of room to fall and still be performing well, you know. Uh, any company making 22% net profit is doing very well. Company net worth hasn't really grown much. It's at the same value it was back in 2014. So it's not a stock that's going to grow much in size now, it seems. But debt levels are fine. Uh, they pay a wonderful dividend of almost 7%. The interesting thing here is the price. It's trading at £50 a share. But by my calculations, that's actually great value. So this is a business making uh, $6.16 earnings per share. When you convert that to Great British Pounds, it works out about £4.71 a share. So for a £50 per share outlay, it's not a bad return, suggesting that 50 quid is a good price. Uh, I also like the net worth of the business relative to the price. So it's a stock that is probably undervalued right now, but isn't likely to grow significantly in share price, but will deliver you 7% a year 
in dividends. So it's not bad at all. Uh, this Livium deal also seems to make a lot of sense for the future. So I, I like the noise coming from, from Rio's direction there. Um, it looks like Applied Nutrition are going to go public later this month. The protein powder company are planning to float on the London Stock Exchange and filed to do so yesterday. They've set a price range, uh, a float price range of £1.36 to £1.60 as the initial price with 137 million shares going on sale. This is a company that already have JD Sports as one of their major shareholders. There are also reports that Mosin Issa, who started Euro Garages and now owns a big chunk of Asda, is planning to make a significant purchase to the tune of about 25 million. This is a Liverpool-based company that over the last five years, they've been achieving over 22% net profits per year. And it's a company growing rapidly. As of July's latest yearly earnings, they've reached a revenue of 86 million and net profits per year of 18.6 million, which is superb. Question is, with this and all other IPOs, will this level of profitability continue after the float and are the shares currently overpriced? And that's a really tricky question. I've been trying to crunch the numbers. The problem is you can't use last year's accounts to assess the value of the business because 137 million shares are about to be added into circulation. Uh, and at £1.36 to £1.60 per share, they're set to make probably an extra 180 to 200 million on the sale of those shares. So this then changes everything on a per share basis, of course. More shares in circulation, more net worth from the incoming cash. So it's a tricky one. I don't usually touch IPOs. They tend to be volatile. They usually join the market overhyped, therefore can often be overpriced. This doesn't mean the share price can't go up. Certainly, you know, immediately. It depends on, on demand and the surrounding hype for the stock. But based on my, and I'll caveat this by saying they're very crude numbers, I would say £1.90 would be my top limit for the value of these shares. So I'd say the OP IPO price is probably about right. But IPOs are a big risk. You know, we've seen, was it Groupon? They floated at something like $540. Uh, I think they've fallen all the way to about $13 since they floated on the stock market. So, you know, there are some big risks out there by jumping on a, on a company that haven't proven that they can, you know, perform on the exchanges. So personally, I tend to stay away from them, give them some time to kind of bed in, then, then assess the value based on more solid figures. And if the price is right, and I still like the stock a bit later down the line, then I'll get in. Sure, that makes me late for the party, but the way I see it, you don't always need to be the first person in in order to make any money out of it. So all the people rushing to get in the door early remind me of these kind of Black Friday sales, you know. I'd rather sit back and watch for a bit and, 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 and watch for a while and then get in once I know there's less risk of, of failure. Uh, Bytes Technology Group, ticker BYIT, who floated back in 2021, this week announced a 3% drop in revenue for half one 2024, but a 9% increase in gross profit. They stated that growth was largely down to software sales and public sector clients like the NHS and HMRC that use their software. Uh, they've opened new offices in Sunderland and Portsmouth and renewed their Microsoft Azure expert status, having sold 130,000 co-pilot licenses. Companies say that going forward, they continue to focus on the growing demand for cloud computing and AI. And financially, this is a strong business. Solid revenue growth since they joined the London Stock Exchange. They floated at £3.10 in 2021, immediately fell to lows of 275 before recovering in the same month and since then, having never seen 310 again, they've reached highs of £6.50 earlier this year. However, the price has tumbled somewhat this year, is now back down to about £4.60 a share. Looking at the underlying value of the business, I wonder if this is a victim of previous hype because the value of the business, it doesn't reflect such a high price. The business has a net worth of £78 million, but there's over 240 million shares in circulation. So when you divide that up per share, that's a value of about 30p, yet they're asking £4.60 for a share. So, you know, what's pushing the share price higher is probably the profitability of the company, which is about 22% net profit a year. So that's great. So that's going to push up the value. You know, people are going to, there's more demand for the stock, even though, you know, it's worth about 30p a share in terms of net value. Uh, and the, the shares are going for £4.60. If it's making 22% net profit, people are going to be prepared to pay a bit more. Uh, but when crunched, the numbers to me suggest about £3 per share uh, based on the, the profits that the business is generating. 
but you're getting very little equity for that. And this isn't a huge dividend payout, 1.9%. 1 so I don't see much reason to be overpaying for the stock. I think this is a stock that's overvalued right now. Uh, finally, it looks like shareholders of stockbrokers Hargreaves Lansdowne have now voted in favour of the takeover by the equity, the private equity firm and consortium, CVC or whatever they're called. 83% uh, voted in favour, 13% voted no to the deal. It's quite a large percentage for shareholder votes. So there was some objection to the whole thing going through, but it's gone through uh, massively in favour, of course. The deal is expected to now go through in quarter one of 2025. Shareholders are set to receive £11.40 per share in cash and a 30 pence per share dividend. What does this mean for investors using the platform? For their stocks and shares ISA etc and the answer is probably not much there's no major changes expected to the service the company owners are simply changing hands from the public shareholders to now private shareholders but no news has been provided on any plans or changes to the Hargreaves Lansdowne services or their platform or what they provide you know in terms of stocks and shares ISAs and other types of ISAs and investment vehicles uh, so most expect there to be no significant changes we're going to take a break now, but when I come back, we're going to talk about a book that is one of my top top 10 favorite books of all time that I believe has truly helped me transform my financial wealth. Down to Earth, long-term UK stock investing. You're listening to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. Charlie talked about living within your means a lot, and it's such an obvious thing, but if you had all the rules of money written in order, you could follow just rule number one and never need money ever again, which is if you always spend less than you earn, you will literally never need money. You wouldn't even need your savings because you would always spend less than you earn. So you would never lack for money. It's rule number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Because like you can't even do investing where rule number one is don't lose money. Rule number two is don't forget rule number one. Well, you couldn't do that unless you spent less than you earned. And so like rule zero is spend less than you earn. And what's crazy is that so many people are trying to find advanced and complicated trading and investing tactics when they haven't even mastered balancing their budget. And so he had such, such an emphasis on doing the fundamentals that I think just his, his repeated emphasis of that and just now paired with my own experience, having grown relatively large companies. I mean, over the last three years, we've added 100 million in revenue organically from the companies we have in the portfolio. So I feel relatively confident in talking about it. We don't do anything complicated ever. All we do is continually try and simplify the business and do the fundamentals everywhere all the time. That's it. Because doing the fundamentals everywhere all the time is already as complicated as, as you can imagine. Doing anything beyond that doesn't even happen in reality. And so if you do the fundamentals everywhere all the time, you become an advanced business owner. That was Alex Hormozy, a YouTube sensation now, I guess, uh, owner of acquisition.com and uh, yeah, sharing some wise wisdom that was passed down to him from Charlie Munger, which is uh, essentially what I want to do now, but not from Charlie Munger. This last week or so, I've been reading one of my favorite books of all time, and it will be the third time that I've read it now. The first time was 10 years ago. I was age 32, and it was probably the catalyst for all of this, the investing, the podcast, the work I do today. It led me to really think about how I could add value in the world and, of course, grow my wealth. It was the first time I'd ever contemplated how money worked. And this book is called The Richest Man in Babylon by George L. Clayson. And it's a relatively small book and uh, absolutely worth reading it. Many of you will have already read it. Uh, it's quite a well-known book, but I'm sharing this information for those that haven't. There are many people listening to this podcast now. We're getting over 1,250 downloads per, per episode, per week. 
And many of those people listening, many of you guys listening will not have heard of this book. And so I wanted to take just a little bit of time out to discuss some aspects of it and to tell my story, how it affected me and, and, and the lessons that I learned from it, really, rather than just regurgitate the book. It was the first time I ever contemplated how money actually worked. And I came from a family who didn't have much money. My mum and dad worked their butts off. Uh, most of my childhood, just to make sure that we had enough income, enough money. We weren't a poor family. I had a Sega Mega Drive. Uh, <laughs> I had clean clothes, toys. I had, a, we had, you know, family had a car. But, you know, at the same time, we would go camping, save money in the summer. My bike was picked up from the tip and my dad fixed it up for me so we didn't have to fork out for a new bike. Uh, the TV in my room was one of these old-fashioned, big, huge TVs that... To tune it in, you had to twist this little dial thing and push the buttons in to switch the, to, between the four channels, you know, and uh, it was black and white. And, you know, it was picked up from the tip. My, it was my dad. My mum and dad couldn't afford a brand new TV for their for their 10 year old son for his bedroom. So they gave me a, an old black and white one they found on the tip. So it wasn't hardship, but I knew that whenever I got something big, mum and dad must have worked hard for me to get it. So. Fast forward many years, when my kids started arriving on the scene, I made a change and I decided to start investing in myself. I wasn't happy with where I was in life and I started reading books and naturally I was reading books on things like wealth and making money. What I actually started off doing was listening to Tony Robbins tapes in my car during my lunch breaks. And love him or hate him, I'm not as much of a fan as I was back then. I kind of feel like I've outgrown that kind of stuff now. I used to listen to Tony Robbins audiobooks on my phone, in my car, during my lunch breaks at work that led me to this book. He introduced this book to me on one of his tapes. And I bought it secondhand for about £4 and it was the greatest £4 investment I have ever made because it sparked a huge change in me that I would genuinely would say contributed significantly to where I am today. If you haven't read the book, you absolutely should. Even if you don't read books, this one is tiny. It won't take you long to read it, but the lessons are profound. And I wanted to discuss one of the seven lessons that are in this book. The first rule states that most people receive their income every month and proceed to give it all away. They give it to the supermarket, the local restaurant, Just Eat, Deliveroo, Netflix, Amazon Prime, clothing shops, shoe shops, whatever. And they've got nothing left at the end of the month. And as a result, this replays itself every month for 10, 20 years. For some, it lasts a lifetime. And these people never get ahead because they give everything they work hard to make away. So the first rule is the first rule to amassing great wealth is to keep a portion of everything you earn for yourself. And it's as simple as that. When you receive your income, before you give anything away, you take a slice of it for you and your future, for your family. You worked hard to earn this income, of course. So you sh so shouldn't some of it be for you to use for a, 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 to build a better future? Of course. And when I read this, it wasn't as if I'd never heard of this idea, this idea of taking some of your wages and putting it in a savings pot. I tried to save money plenty of times in the past, but it was just the way the book delivered it to me. I think in the past, what I was doing was taking money, putting it in a savings account. Then a bill came along and we took the money back out of the savings account and we got nowhere. This book delivered it to me in a different way. And sometimes it's the delivery that resonates. And this book resonated with me. And I remember feeling quite disgusted with myself, but also a little bit embarrassed that I'd been giving my money away for years. And the trick from this point, once you you need to build this pot of money up, essentially, that you, you're taking 10 percent of your income, putting it to one side and not touching it, not getting not being allowed to go anywhere near it. And. You use that money once it's built up in this pot to then increase your income further. So imagine you're getting 10 gold coins and under this rule, you keep in one of those 10 and giving nine away. And eventually over time, those little ones will build into five or six gold coins. And then you take those five or six gold coins and use them to raise your income. And if you do this well, you'll be able to raise your income to, let's say, 12 gold coins. You start keeping two and giving away 10. Now, automatically, already, you're back at your original standard of living. But now you're keeping two gold coins. 
every time whilst maintaining that original getting back to that original standard of living where you're giving all 10 away so the pot grows bigger and faster now because you're keeping two and you use that part of money to raise your income to 15 and now you're keeping four each time but you can give away 11 and you don't need me to go on anymore about that you can see where it's going you become a money making machine but when people hear this one of the first objections is well I can't live on nine coins and keep one that's too hard and this is the second rule about managing your expenses you'll find this in the book there are many people in the UK right now that are living on 90% of your income and they may even live on the same street as you and these people have no choice because it's all they have and it shows us that we can adapt we have to adapt if the government came along tomorrow and applied a 10% tax on your earnings you know you kick and scream there'd be protests all sorts but you'd ha you'd adapt you'd have to that you'd have no choice and if you want to get wealthy this is a necessary change you must adapt and as we just saw it's only a temporary adaptation to what you're doing because once you start to raise your income you very quickly get back to the standard of living you were in you just got to take a small step back and cut down your expenses a little bit to be able to get this working so that you can get back to where you were but now doing so while still being able to put money aside and when I learned this rule and this system I got to work and I saved so much money it's insane that I wasn't already doing it and it was because I was so determined to get there and I wanted to briefly walk you through this process because when you really want to achieve something you tend to find a way and I found a way uh, I looked at my my budget my my income my expenditures more than anything looking at my expenditures what could I do to cut my expenditures down so that I would have more capital to play with I couldn't raise my income at that point I didn't have any gold coins and so I looked at my expenditures so that I could free up some of my income to be able to put aside and you know I just, just as an example I added a, a subscription to something called Crunchyroll which was some silly I used to, went for a phase of watching these Japanese anime shows and I was paying £10 a month for it and I never used it I'd never even watched one of the shows. I don't. I just went through this kind of impulse buying process where I was like, oh, 10 quid a month, yeah, I'll get that. And maybe I'll watch some of the shows. And I held it for about three years. <laughs> and so, you know, that's probably about a thousand quid that I lost over those three years on this subscription that I never used. So I culled that, got rid of that. That brought me in 10 pound extra a month. It's nothing on its own, but you'll see where this is going in a moment. We were, me and my family at the time, uh, were, were taking out we're getting delivery takeout deliveries often uh, I would get home from work the last thing I wanted to do was cook my partner at the time wasn't really interested in cooking she'd been with the kids all day uh, and so we would end up t getting takeouts all the time and you know, very unhealthy for the body very unhealthy for the bank balance and I worked out that we were spending about 100 pounds a month at the time I mean that wouldn't get you much nowadays but back then 10 years ago 100 pound a month or so we were spending on just eat or delivery or whatever it was at the time or just going down to the takeout and bringing it home you know before people would bring it to your door all the time and so we were spending £100 a month on that and we worked out that instead if we could just be a bit more disciplined we could stop that and instead we probably have to spend a little bit more on shopping you know regular groceries maybe an extra 30 quid I worked out that we probably saved about £70 a month just culling that but making a lifestyle change we stopped our TV license we weren't watching TV it was off all day every day the kids would use it to watch YouTube and that was it and so we got rid of the TV license. It was like fifteen pound a month. I think we were paying at the time. I don't know. Uh, car insurance managed to get that down by ten pound a month. I cancelled Audible because I'd used it a quite a fair bit, but I had the physical books in the house, so I just started reading the physical books more than I listened to Audible and got rid of that. That was about eight pound a month. We got a new broadband deal and saved fifteen pound a month there. We stopped going for meals out, saved seventy pounds there. Uh, I used to go for coffee lunches quite often and spend £10 every time I went out. So we stopped doing that uh, to save £10 there. We reduced our food waste, you know, food that was going in the bin because it didn't get eaten in time. We were just a lot more sensible about what we were buying, what do we need, 
we put some sort of like a system together on what food, what dinners we were going to have so that nothing went to waste. So that stuff didn't rot in the back of the fridge or the back of the cupboards, you know. And we probably saved ourselves about £20 a month in unnecessary food purchases that way. Uh, we had a fridge insurance for £5 a month. We got rid of that. The fridge wasn't even worth the insurance. Uh, we, I, I renegotiated my mobile phone down by about £10 a month. Uh, I had different software subscriptions that I think I saved another £12 a month. I got rid of Spotify, which is a music app. I got rid of that for £10 a month. Amazon Prime, I got rid of the, the subscription to that just so I could get my parcels a bit quicker. But, uh, that's fine. I can live without that for a little while. You know, so save another £10 on that, £10 a month. Uh, we stopped re renting movies, started watching the ones we'd already bought. Uh, for Saved about £5 a month doing that. And I looked around the house and I noticed just stuff that I'd bought of Amazon that I just didn't need, that I'd never used. And I thought to myself, I've got a real problem where I buy stuff on Amazon that just sits around the house and doesn't get used. Or stuff that I look at and think, I bought it and then found I didn't need it. And it was just money down the drain. And I think being a lot more sensible about the money that I was spending, I ended up saving about £20 a month on just cutting down my Amazon purchases every month. And this, when you add it all together, believe it or not, goes to, you get a calculator out and go through all of that if you want to, but it comes to £300 a month saved. Now, I have a compounding calculator. I created this on Google Sheets and I'm going to share the link to it in the description of this podcast. So if you want to have a little play on it, it's completely open for you to do so. And it's quite crude. I've called it version 1.0 because I'll probably improve it over time. But what it allows you to do is it's a simple calculator that lets you put in a starting balance, your monthly deposits, so how much you can afford to pump into your investment account, your expected rate of return, your expected dividend yield return. And it gives you some meaningful, realistic expectations of what you can achieve from that. And I'm just going to do it now whilst I'm live on, on the show. But if I put a thousand pound starting balance in and put 300 pound a month, which I've saved from all my outgoings into my investing, let's say I'm getting a rate of return of on average 12% a year, which is I think that's relatively conservative based on my personal experience so far over the last 10 years of doing this. Uh, and a 4% dividend yield, which is pretty standard, pretty average. What that would do if you're starting on a thousand pounds is that by the end of 10 years, you would be on a hundred thousand pounds, just shy of it, 93,000 pounds. So you'd nearly have a hundred grand sitting there built up after 10 years of doing this. That's assuming you don't add to that 300 pounds a month that you're pumping in. That's assuming that you don't get a better rate of return of 12%. You know, it's a, a relatively conservative rate of return, you'd be sitting on about a hundred thousand pounds. That would itself be paying you about three hundred pound a month in dividend income. Just paying back to you three hundred pound a month in dividend income. Which, if you're sensible and wise, you wouldn't be taking that money out of the account. You'd be using it to to seed back into. You'd be reinvesting that back into your investment portfolio to in, to increase the rate of growth. But that's what you could expect to achieve in fifteen years. Again, assuming you didn't increase the monthly deposits, assuming that you weren't uh, achieving higher than 12% rate of return, uh, you'd be on a quarter of a million pounds in 15 years. In 20 years, you'd be on half a million. And it would take you 25 years from now to hit that million pound. And a lot of people say, well, you know, a million pound really isn't that rich anymore, but it's a million pound. I don't understand these people that that put it down, that say, well, you know, it's not that exciting, but it's, you don't have that million pounds right now. <laughs> so that is life changing. If you had a million pounds, you'd be making three grand a month on dividends alone. Just on dividends, you'd be able to, you know, do pretty well out of that. And yeah, you're right. It's not today in today's standard. A million pounds is not rich but it's a million pound you don't currently have. And if you don't do this, never will have. That's the key kind of takeaway is that if you don't make a change, then what you're on now will be forever what you have, as in your rate of income probably won't change that much. 
your savings probably won't change that much and you won't have any investments. So to say oh, a million, that's not that great. <laughs> it's like, well, that's a million more than you have right now. So I don't understand that mindset. But um, my point is that that £300, you can make a massive change pretty quickly. In just five years, you could have 31 grand say invested. £31,000 in five years' time, which is 31 grand. You know, if you won a, some sort of competition and got 30 grand, that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, the difference is that you built this. You've learned the skills on how to grow wealth at that point. You haven't just been given it. You know, quick money coming in ends up going quickly because you end up spending it. You haven't learned the lessons of how to keep money and build it and grow it. This teaches you how to build it and grow it. When I started making these massive savings, what I chose to actually do, and this is something else you can do, is you start reducing your debts. Because if you're paying a monthly fee on your debts like I was back then, it actually pays to pay down that debt to start paying it down a bit quicker. Using that extra £300 a month that you've saved to pay down your debts quicker. I had a debt of like 15 grand or something at one point, And I contacted the bank and I actually negotiated a new loan that would pay off that old loan, but the new loan was at far reduced rates of APR. And so I ended up saving myself like £150 a month just by doing that, just by making a, a quick phone call and changing my rates and saving 150 quid a month. Uh, and then I ended up paying off that debt over time, using that extra 300, four, well, it's by then £450 a month additional money that I had to pay down that debt on top of the usual payments that I was making. And that saved me another sort of 180 quid or something. By the end of the debt paying off process, I had about a thousand pounds a month extra in my pocket. And again, if you go to the compounded interest calculator, if you're now putting in a thousand pounds a month into that account and let's say five years down the line it takes you five years to get there so you're sitting on a starting balance now of about 30 grand and you're put, pumping in a thousand pounds a month and you've got a rate of return of 12 percent and a dividend yield of four then in just 15 more years you'd hit a million from 30k to a million in just 15 more years which makes the whole process 20 years I don't know how old you are now listening to this, but in 20 years, you could be a millionaire if you start making these changes in your life. And like I say, the link to the compounding calculator is in the description of the podcast. So go down to the, the podcast description text. You'll see a link there that will take it to you to take you to it. I've tried to protect it. So hopefully, you know, no one's going to mess it up or ruin it. Go in there, start playing with the figures in the yellow, the, the yellow numbers on the right hand side. And crunch your numbers and just get a feel for what it could achieve you in terms of rate of return. I think it's a very important exercise to do. And I think it can also give you a real insight into what can be achieved by just making some really simple life changes that anyone can do. And that's how I want to leave it with you this week. We've run out of time now on the show, so I'm going to wrap it up. But uh, thank you so much for tuning into the show and supporting the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. I will see you guys next week. Cheers. You've been listening to the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. Real and raw, telling you like it really is. There's a lot to long-term stock investing. But Chris's passion is to bring you all the information you need that's easily understood while having a damn good time doing it. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, rate, and review. But wait, there's more. Hit the website at www.chrischillingworth.com. From there, you can grab Chris's books, the podcast, videos, free courses, and tips and advice on successful stock investing. It's been a pleasure. See you next time on the Diary of a UK Stock Investor podcast. <laughs>